Welcome to the TC Dojo from Single Sourcing Solutions. The TC Dojo is a tech comm community driven by you. Tell us what you want to learn, you choose the topics, and we find the experts. In the TC Dojo open session today, we have Andrew Davis. I've been waiting a long time to see this presentation. He's presented to many local groups several times, and I've just missed it one after another. Luckily, he's with us here today. Ageism is an issue that affects all of us, and we hit it from both sides eventually. Andrew is a well-known presenter, speaker here in the Bay Area, and everyone always enjoys it whenever he presents. And I'm delighted he could join us today. Andrew, are you ready? I am ready, Liz. Thank you. Because it's all yours. Wonderful. Thank you for the introduction and for the opportunity to, to speak to whomever might be listening and curious about ageism and how it affects technical services workers. Um, I am going to, in, in my tradition as a former technical writer and recruiter of tech writers, um, start with a table of contents. Um, you, will, you will find ageism um, everywhere you look. It's real and it's difficult to prove. Um, you will also find it over, you can overcome it with the right attitude and the right effort. You probably need to know, however, how you are perceived in more detail, and I will be blunt about that. First, some acronyms, because we are technical communicators, at least at this end of the wire. Um, OC is an older candidate, HT, hiring team, TW could be a tech writer or a technology worker. So first, just to prove that I know something about my audience, or at least I'm defining it, um, I will tell you about my biases, my disclaimers, and then I'll tell you a little bit about what the industry um, context is as well. Um, first, I recruit content developers in Silicon Valley. I've done so for almost 20 years. Routinely work with people in their 50s, 60s, and 70s. Almost never work with people in their 20s and 30s. They don't have the skills my clients need, and they certainly don't have the depth of experience. Uh, furthermore, I am not a lawyer, and I'm not looking for an adversarial solution. I'm not looking to entrap a client or a candidate in a situation in which somebody could be found at fault. I'm looking instead to build bridges and to find ways to, to efficiently get across the goal line. The industry's context. Well, those of you who survived the 90s will recognize this. Uh, at least in Silicon Valley, we are frothy. Um, and engineers control the budgets, again. People that understand technical communications and the value of content, not so much. I don't remember the last time I met a tech pubs manager who controlled their own budget. Um, all sorts of new technology. Uh, a lot of open source these days. Um, all these things demand new skills. Products, tools that you've never heard of become the tool du jour, and they are definitely things to keep up with, and most technical workers have not kept current. That's a simple fact. Hiring teams are looking for peers with similar skills. They're looking in the mirror and saying, match that, but call them a tech writer. They want similar work ethic, they want similar values, they want similar almost everything, and they distrust when they don't find that. They tend to value similarity to themselves over the experience and wisdom they could hire in an experienced technical content developer. Okay, so this is going to be relatively straightforward, I believe, this section. Um, when should you suspect that you're facing ageism? Pretty simple. Um, your portfolio reviews, your, on, your online portfolio reviews, your phone interviews, they go really well, but the face-to-face -face interviews don't. And there's hesitancy, there's um, closed body, content, body image, body, um, body language, rather. And you're going to find a great deal of uh, awkwardness to put it politely, when the hiring team realizes that you are a couple decades older than their average age. When the hiring team goes silent or says, gee, you have too much experience, they're saying a bunch of things. They're saying, you know too much and you may contradict us. You have experience for which we don't want to pay and that's not best value for our dollar. 
also they're sometimes saying we want you to know less than less about our audience um, and sometimes about our tools and about how this has been done before than you already do. We don't want a dialogue. We want to tell you what to do. Often the feedback boils down to you're overqualified. That's code, and it often means, yeah, ages in this way. All right. What specifically is worrying the hiring team? What are their underlying concerns? Cultural fit. Now, this is a blanket term. I will fully admit that the, <laughs> the issue of culture is a I'll know it when I see it kind of arrangement. Um, none of these people are going to be terribly articulate about it other than say, you know, we work hard and play hard and we love it here. Well, that's nice, but they're not you and they don't really know how to transpose their values to you or communicate them, let alone communicate them. Energy level. This is easier to articulate. They work long hours, they don't have lives, certainly no balanced lives, and they very often want you to drink the Kool-Aid. If you don't get enthusiastic about the idea of uh, Red Bull and vodka, or Nerf Wars, or group uh, web, you know, group, group snowboarding weekends, or um, ping pong events that revolve around drinking, um, then you may not have exactly the full compatibility they're hoping for. Next, your health. They are worried, and quite rightly, because it can be proven that <laughs> older people cost more to insure. They're worried about their financial hit, the financial hit of hiring an older worker. Um, so I've already mentioned insurance costs do rise. Also, should things not work out, should they ultimately need to cut you loose, they're going to have to work an awful lot harder than they would for somebody who is under 40, because those over 40 are in a protected class. This is similar to uh, people with disabilities, physical disabilities, people who are pregnant, pregnant, and a bunch of other issues that affect average workers but have to be over-documented, if you will, in order to take action against. So they have quite legitimate concerns in that respect. Older workers often lack younger workers' tolerance for chaos. For them, it's exciting. It's adrenaline act, and nothing could be more engrossing than total chaos. And the uh, shall we say, the unwillingness to, to nail things down, either interfaces or schedules or a bunch of other factors that might, in your view, make the job survivable and actually interesting and, and not just a, uh, a hamster wheel exercise. They're going to look at your reaction to their love of chaos and say, is that, is that going to work? Or are we going to feel too much pressure to decide before we're ready to decide? Finally, well, in this page, the next item, flexibility. Are you sufficiently interested in exploring new tools, new processes, new systems? And here I have in mind, in particular, the, um, the Average startups preference for cheaper, less powerful tools, um, open source tools typically, wikis and um, simple open source content management systems by contrast with uh, you know, $1,000 plus tools like FrameMaker or Oxygen or Flare or, you know, there are, there are a bunch of other tools that we use daily that help us, make us more efficient, but in their view, keep us in the silo and make it impossible for them to add or change the content. They don't want to hear us arguing for expensive tools when they think that Markdown and any number of open source content management systems could be the, the solution.
Okay, so I have a second page called the underlying concerns, the first item of which is your compatibility with agile development um, and your willingness to wear more than one hat, whether the other hat is marketing or technical support or sales, UX. If you say, you know, I'm a pro at technical writing and this is what I do and this is what I want to do and if you throw other things at me, I'm not going to be as comfortable. If they see that in your face or in your background, they're going to have some hesitancy here. Again, these are reflections of age and experience and the cultural anomaly between um, the boomers and the Generation Y set. Next, the on-site and open seating um, paradigm. This is designed, in their view, to allow spontaneity and synergistic interaction. To you, it is often perceived as a hindrance, a hindrance to concentration, a hindrance to productivity, and a, a frustration since you are perhaps not as used to triple tasking or multitasking as the rest of these people. Um, your idea of a good time is not to sit at a 50 foot long table facing 30 other people who are doing totally different work, having to have headphones on and trying harder to focus than everyone else just to get words around the, comp the complicated concepts that you are handling. Next, experience versus potential. In my experience, I have found that older workers argue from experience, as in this is the way it's been, this is what I've found, this is what it's likely to be again. Younger Generation Y folk are often selling potential. This is the way it could work. This is the way it's supposed to work. This is the way I thought it should work. This is the way I read about it on the vendor's website. Again, they're saying, use these cheaper, cheaper tools. Use these uh, untested but potentially superior solutions and be the guinea pig. And you're saying, I don't have any time to be a guinea pig. I don't have the energy level to fix bugs in the vendor software. I don't want to be a beta tester on a deadline. Again, this is a cultural chasm that we often face. Next, user compatibility. If a, if a Generation Y company is, a Generation Y hiring team is saying to themselves, you don't understand our users because they're used to Googling all the answers and cutting and pasting code samples and they won't read more than a paragraph at a time, probably more than a sentence or two at a time. You are going to be perceived as incompatible with their users. You need to, you need to anticipate and address that. And I'll cover that in the next session. And then there's the final category of their fear of Age and treachery will overcome uh, youth and skill. You've perhaps heard that term. You'll see an asterisk um, after that item. An asterisk at the end of any of my slides indicates that there are significant um, additional editorial contributions on my part um, in the speaker's notes, so don't hesitate to ask for those. OK, so how do we address hiring team's concerns. First of all, please keep calm. Second, do not lecture. Third, preemptively address the concerns that you, have, that you sense are coming up, either via their body language or their objections or a bunch of other things. Let's get specific here. You must preemptively counter the hiring team's age-related concerns by selling the following qualities. First of all, your efficiency. I've gone into detail here on the, on the slides, but I go into further detail in the speaker's notes for this slide. Your past experience in similar situations gives you a sixth sense for what works, what users need, and the easiest way to achieve those goals. If you can convince the hiring team that that experience overcomes inexperience and the potential desire to work weekends to 
we reinvent the wheel, then you win that particular round. Next, quality. Your past successes and your failures will help you understand and avoid typical pitfalls. To recognize the right solution more readily, to deliver with less friction. Very much the same as with efficiency, but focusing now on quality. You are going to get it right the first time, or closer to the right solution the first time, because you've been down this road before, and you know where half of these roads end in dead ends. You can tell them gently and considerately, and without being parental about it, that that's unlikely to help unless you take the following, take the following turns before you reach an impasse, before the brick wall at the end of the road. Next, focus. You can easily tune out the noise and apply effort where it will do most good. Now, I'm not talking here about open seating plans and that kind of noise, but you know as well as any older technical communicator, as well as any older technology worker, that there is a lot of dialogue on the way to a decision. And you also know which of the, the concerns that are raised during that dialogue are likely to be valid and, and which are just posturing. That lets you tune out the noise. You can focus on where the real concerns, where, where the valid concerns are, and, and get, res get resolution there much more readily than weighing every single person's objections and or concerns and or ego tripping equally. So that's going to make you a better investment. And if you can say that gently, without judgment, then you win that round too. Next, pacing. I would say in my experience that older workers have a reluctance to fry on the job. Many times they are, uh, they have recovered from the, the frying pan. Maybe they survived the 90s and, and worked all hours and burnt out along the way. And they have reestablished some normalcy, some sanity in their schedules and their lives. They've got some balance. They are reluctant to, to embark on fire drills. And this is actually an asset if you frame it correctly. If you can work steadily and sanely, if you can make, make commitments over the long term, you are not going to crash and burn. Or at least you're not going to crash and burn quite as soon or quite as readily or quite as without notice. You are going to actually get across the finish line for them. You are going to represent a better investment. And you can make it clear that the more you know, the more you learn, the more information you gather through a sanely paced schedule and sanely paced delivery, the better you will be able to serve them in the future. If they hire somebody who has to learn it all again and go down a number of dead ends and won't pace themselves, that person will fry, will leave, and will have to start again. Next up, self-awareness. The the older candidate understands their own strengths and their weaknesses to a much greater extent than younger candidates. They also, by implication, know when to seek help and when to delegate. You know what you do well. You know what you want control over. You know what, what not to do. And you are not proud about saying, this is a poor use of my time. When you see job descriptions that say, you must create your own code examples. You might sell them on your ability to read code and maybe even test code. But if you don't say, and I'm not a very efficient software developer, assuming that you are not, you haven't played the experience card sufficiently well. You haven't said, look, I won't create this code nearly as efficiently as you will. If you still want me to create this code or code examples, great, I'll try. Oh, and I'll likely succeed. I'll do well, but it won't be an efficient use of my time. I would prefer to delegate that. Next, 
you will accept suboptimal outcomes, changes of plans, um, changes of team, changes of well, almost any other changes, without blaming anybody. You can take that in stride to a much greater extent than most. Next, frankness. Your candor, when you are realistic about your own limitations, and you can assess risks, that is a huge asset to this company, these people who are not always in it for for the long right, long term. They are thinking, how do I impress? How do I make a good impression? How how can I get by without saying no? How can I uh, dodge the bullet without admitting that I have weaknesses? Your your candor about your own limitations can be refreshing in that context. As long as you have respect for the key roles that you serve, they are going to be grateful that you call it a spade a spade and grateful that you can make them aware before it's too late about issues over which you, with which you have some experience and where you have some control. Okay, clarity. If you can set clear, clear expectations, you won't overcommit and then bomb nearly as readily, nearly as consistently. You may overcommit by, by mistake, but you won't do it deliberately. And finally, some hiring teams actually, amazingly, want help improving their own processes. They've realized that communication is a core skill that they didn't learn in engineering school, they certainly didn't learn earlier, and they realize that to get ahead, they're going to need to do better presentations, better pitches, better, um, better you name it, with the spoken and the written word. You can help there if they'll let you. Again, this is a matter of presenting yourself as an ally without loading it over them. You don't want to appear judgmental, parental, or admonishing in any respect, but you want to make them look good. Okay. So, I'm going to summarize what makes older candidates, what brings older candidates the best results. And this is obviously a matter for a huge amount of discussion, and I would love the opportunity offline to, to deal with specific uh, queries that you might have. So let's just read through these. I think a lot of it boils down to putting the hiring team's needs first. As a recruiter, I get to troubleshoot and, um, oh well, let's call a spade a spade. I get to firefight um, the situations where older candidates say that their pride gets in the way and their, their confidence and often their um, casual attitude is perceived as, from the, from the hiring team's perspective, as disrespect, as not taking the work seriously. Um, you wouldn't believe quite how many times I get to intervene and say, actually, I think you misread those signals. Here's what they're doing, here's their motive, and it's all to the good. Talking younger generation Y hiring teams out of their initial judgment of I have been dissed by somebody's obvious, you know, lack of obvious willingness to put my needs first, uh, it's a little bit scary. Anyway, um, be careful of your pride is the summary of number one. Don't lecture. Do not bully with your experience. If you, if you tell them you know better, if you tell them, you know, XML is just the next version of what I dealt with when I, you know, documented software on IBM mainframes, if you tell them that there's nothing new under the sun, if you tell them that what they're doing is just being hamsters on a wheel, you're going to offend them, um, and they don't appreciate that. They may think you're right, and they may want to take you up on the reasons for your comments, but if they feel judged, you can bet you become the enemy in no time to 
If you meet hiring teams more than halfway, if you become their ally and you go out of your way to, uh, to accommodate but also to anticipate their needs, to make them look good, then you are, you win the war. And in every situation, you are likely to get the benefit of the doubt. You may, you may be the butt of the jokes about how poorly you program or how poorly you use the latest tool that they have discovered, but they're grateful that you are willing to make the effort. And if you don't make that effort and don't make yourself uh, don't make it obvious that you're making that effort, then they'll have their doubts and they'll feel that you are incompatible with their doubts. All right, here's another catch-all phrase. Find ways to become indispensable. I remember working at Oracle 88 to 91 right after their IPO, and there were an awful lot of 20-somethings there who had hired straight out of CS programs. All the technical marketing people had uh, computer science and MBA degrees. And they couldn't write. They couldn't. They couldn't articulate anything. They had great academic credentials, but down in the real world, they they were uh, ineffective. And I was able to come along and not only clean up their communications, but advise them about the impressions they were making and how to look good at various uh, conferences and in interactions with executives and so forth. And I never got credit, but I did get an awful lot of repeat business, an awful lot of phone calls when these people moved on to other companies or to different teams. Do you know anybody who can do this like you used to do this for me, Andrew? It was a huge credibility builder and a huge alliance builder. So it is possible to become almost indispensable out there. Finally, well, next, I should say, if you can achieve autonomy with the technology, with the tools, with this company's products, without having to ask how to spin up a virtual machine or how to do this, or how to do that, which they consider kind of basic, then they're going to have a great deal more respect for you. So put some energy into that. It's not documentation these days, at least in Silicon Valley, is not about taking dictation. It's not about getting them to explain things to you. It is about immersing yourself in the product and the development environment, learning everything you can. And when you've got an impasse, you've learned all you can, and you've got some questions to which people around you may not have obvious answers, and you can't find it on Google, and you can't find it in any doc that might exist, that's when you raise your hand and say, I tried this, I tried this, I tried this, and I'm stuck. They will respect you a great deal more. Next, do everything you can to earn trust. This can be everything from showing up on time to webinars, to conferences, to meetings in person and otherwise, to doing things when you say you will. If you make excuses for yourself, your trust is undermined, your, your credibility is undermined very quickly. Um, I've said this before, but make hiring team members look good. This is in the same spirit of becoming indispensable. And then there's over-communicate. You may think you've said it before. You may think you don't need to say it again. You may think that they heard you the first time. Over-communicate. Say it in words. Put it in writing. And don't say it in an admonitory way. Definitely say it in a friendly, I'm here for you. I've got your back but you need to know this is where we are. That way, you, you last longer. There are fewer communication issues for which you can be blamed, and they're going to entrust you with more, more responsibility that involves articulating the mission as well as the progress, and um, they'll, they'll entrust you with more opportunities to, to take more responsibility. So when I present this, this content in person, I ask these questions. How have I resolved or how have you been, how has what I've said resolved issues for you? Or how have you been thwarted by problems related to ageism? 
where have I failed to address your concerns? And then this wonderful catch-all question, are older candidates doomed to work only on temporary assignments? If you are tired of only being offered contracts with the possibility of going firm, but sometimes that distant that possibility fades into the into the sunset, that is not what I see as the the logical fate of, of an older candidate. That is that is what happens when you have failed to demonstrate your versatility and your, your deep value. Um, I can only recommend that you make extra efforts to be overt with the ways in which you can add value to the team. It's not a catch-all. It doesn't, it doesn't always work, but it definitely works most of the time. And ultimately, you will find more willingness to hire among older candidates, among people who have failed to find the right skill set and maturity and other uh, intangible skills among the young workers. Often it takes them a couple tries to realize, no, people of our generation don't have it. They just don't. So they will turn to an older worker who's got most of it and isn't isn't as interested in overpromising. So, a few more techniques. Um, again, a reiteration of some of the comments I've made thus far. Anticipate their concerns, address them preemptively, and in as much detail as you can. Don't skip over things that you sense matter to them. This is in the in-person interview, in the follow-up, sometimes even in the phone interview. If you get that, well, I'm not sure, I don't know, I'm not going to address that question, or I have these concerns, address them. Address them as quickly as you can. Show that you keep current with technology and are just as productive as your competition and perhaps just as productive as they are. This will win you major points. Their concern about an older worker is sometimes that you just don't fire as fast. Your neurons don't fire as fast and you don't have the energy or the ambition that they do to overcome those obstacles. Show that you do. Show that you are current. Show that what you already know is directly applicable to what they want you to know. Third, characterize the hiring team's goals as you understand them. This is active listening technique. Discuss and demonstrate how you delivered in similar contexts. Give them verifiable proof. This can be references, testimonials, code samples, certainly portfolio samples. You want to show them that they are taking a lesser risk in hiring you than in, in hiring somebody who might be, look just like them, might have a similar academic background, but is going to be a less efficient and less well-paced and less viable long-term investment. So, Again, volunteer the proof. Don't make them beg. If they come to you with these concerns and you don't address them, they are completely justified in moving on to the next candidate. And that next candidate may also be an older worker, but it might not. OK, here's how to reach me for follow-up questions and comments. I'm happy to send along my uh, speaker's notes integrated with slides. And I thank you again for the opportunity to present. That was fantastic. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Liz. All right. So thanks, Andrew, for coming. And make sure that you subscribe to the TC Dojo YouTube channel for to keep to see this video and others that were done over time. Um, make sure you fill out the survey link also so you vote on upcoming topics. Tell us what you want to learn, and we'll find experts like Andrew to share their expertise. Why should we tell you what to learn? You should tell us. And be sure, to, of course, to come back and see us the next time.